Awesome. Excited to uh, start the day with a conversation about uh, the startup ecosystem. Uh, yesterday we talked quite a bit about the benefits of thinking as an ecosystem and i have uh, quite lucky to have two amazing people here, Link and Dave. Uh, very accomplished, very involved in the uh, New Zealand and Wellington startup ecosystems and uh, excited to uh, get your thoughts and your wisdom from it. And uh, why don't I start by asking, uh, some of you guys might know them and some of you might not, uh, just to tell us about your involvement so far with, with the startup ecosystem here in, in New Zealand. Where we start? Uh, tēnā koutou, everyone. Uh, it's good to see you here. Um, I guess, uh, if you don't mind me taking a walk down memory lane, uh, I've kind of got a foot in both camps because I was born in Los Angeles and uh, I moved out to New Zealand uh, as soon as I was done with university uh, at Berkeley in 1981. And uh, yeah, so I've been living out here for, uh, for, for many years. And uh, my first uh, encounter with the startup ecosystem really is when uh, my wife and I, Kate Frickberg, she's just sitting over there, uh, started a business doing a web development company in uh, the uh, early 1990s. And uh, we sort of grew that and eventually sold, sold that company uh, in, uh, in 2002 and used the proceeds uh, for both philanthropic and investment purposes. In, uh, in various startups. So um, I've been active in uh, mainly as an advisor and investor in startups uh, since, uh, since 2005, 2006. And uh, yeah, I've really been enjoying watching the whole startup arena grow. You know, the, the word ecosystem, I think, is slightly deprecated in startup circles. Uh, and so I, I know there's been a f some context around use of the word ecosystem in the last in the last few days. But you know, an ecosystem is generally something that's fairly mature. It's got balance. It's got organisms that, you know, contribute in certain ways and organisms that contribute in other ways and you know everything sort of sort of functions well. I think the startup world is a lot more chaotic than that though. Mm -hmm. And so to describe it as an ecosystem is actually uh, giving it uh, more credit for development than it really has. And I think that chaos is something that really drives the energy in the, in, in the startup world. So I use the word ecosystem all the, all the time, so don't get me wrong, but I, I always sort of question whether or not it really is an ecosystem or whether it's you know, a chaos system or not a system at all, just a collection of weird behavior. So um, yeah, so anyway, for, for all of that, I'm, I'm a director uh, in a number of startups. It's one of the key things in New Zealand is uh, developing relationships uh, outside of New Zealand because to try to do a startup in New Zealand that's focused at four million New Zealanders is is generally uh, uh, you know tears before bedtime. Um, you know we really have to be globally focused in everything we do here and be globally relevant. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know we become irrelevant to the rest of the world. And you know trying to do something for four million people. It's just not economic. So I spent a lot of time trying to encourage startups to think globally, uh, to connect with global markets, to connect with global investors, and uh, to generally do stuff that's going to be of amazing value to people everywhere in the world. So I guess that's kind of the long and the short of what I try to do. Hi, everyone. So um, my name's Link, and um, I'm actually Australian. Um, and it's, I know, <laughs> one of the only people to come the other way, it feels. Um, the, um, it actually began um, in Los Angeles. Um, so um, before I arrived in New Zealand, um, my, one of my first startups um, when I was 23 uh, was acquired. Um, by pop.com, which is a was a DreamWorks company, um, and it was um, I, that's how I ended up in Hollywood. Uh, it was actually one of the biggest failures of Hollywood history, um, but uh, it actually uh, was a really great experience and got me into uh, America. And it was basically a precursor to YouTube was what they were trying to do, and we were basically providing them the community to do that, um, and so. About uh, four or five years ago, um, I moved to New Zealand to start a family. Um, uh, I now have a three and a half year old daughter called Phoenix. And um, the reason um, 
uh, and basically when when I arrived here, um, I really got the the startup bug again, and um, and that process led me to Inspiral, and um, and then it also led me to um, to realize that there were some some real challenges in in building startups uh, in New Zealand, um, and sort of uh, around the the lines of what Dave was saying is that the ecosystem in New Zealand is just really underdeveloped and it's still in that pioneer phase that w was talked about by Gary. Um, and there's a, there is a lot of chaos, but in order for it to function well, um, it seems that uh, there are a number of things missing and, and um, the process over the last year or two um, has been finding out what those things are um, and trying to work um, in the next couple of years of how to fix them. So one of the missing things, really, uh, that uh, uh, my business partner, Stefan Korn, who's now the chief executive of Creative HQ, the, the incubator, and I looked at several years ago was a lack of an accelerator. And so uh, a couple of years ago, some planning went into starting a startup accelerator uh, here uh, in Wellington, and uh, that came to fruition last year with uh, what we call the Lightning Lab, which uh, was a 12-week program uh, based on the Techstars model which takes companies from idea through to investment uh, in this 12-week period. The first month of the three-month program is focused on achieving product market fit. The second month is focused on scaling, and the third month is focused on preparing uh, investor presentations and, and that sort of thing. And so we ran through our first iteration of that uh, in 2013. Uh, we're looking at doing the second iteration uh, in 2014. Uh, the 2013 uh, uh, cohort, uh, there were nine companies. Four of them ach achieved investment on Demo Day. Uh, over two, two point one million, I think, was invested into those four companies, and so uh, all four of those companies are still going. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's it's a very exciting sort of model to be uh, to be working on. And we're looking uh, forward to even better results now that we think we know what we're doing more or less uh, in the uh, in the second year. We're kind of making it up as we went along to a large degree in the first year. <laughs> <laughs> which everyone does. Mm. So, uh, yeah, so the second year should be, should be much better. I've got a question. Uh, Dave, you talked about how you're encouraging startups to think globally. And I'm curious to hear both your thoughts on um, how New Zealand can make a global impact. Uh, what are some of the opportunities that you see coming up in the next few years uh, for us to incubate different types of solutions? that are scalable and, and make a positive impact in the world? Well, that's an, an interesting question because I don't think there's, in terms of the startups that we see coming out of New Zealand, sure, there are some that are based around primary industries, which are really important. So for example, one of the startups I'm, I'm involved with, Expander, uh, is doing uh, anti-counterfeit by attaching uh, custom QR codes to product packaging, which then gets exported to, uh, to China and Asia. So I mean, Using the New Zealand context, you know, milk products are our biggest export, and so you know that's one example of how you can apply a technology solution mm -hmm. uh, to something that New Zealand is really good at, and then export that, and then take that same technology solution and apply it in other in other verticals and other geographies all over the world. Mm -hmm. So we can do that with some things that we're good at, um, but I think you know many of the other startups that we see coming out of New Zealand could be coming out of anywhere. And I think New Zealand produces really great computer science graduates. Uh, so you know we have we have a strength there. Uh, people in New Zealand are tend to be very self reliant. Mm -hmm. Now there's this whole number eight wire um, uh, sort of ethos. People know what number eight wire is for the Americans here. It's a fencing wire. It's used to make the fences that you see between sheep paddocks. And there's this New Zealand myth that you know a, a very skilled a farmer can make anything out of number eight wire. So for example, you know, there are these stories about you know, entire cars made out of number eight wire and so on. So you know, there's this, you know, people are very self-reliant. I actually think that number eight wire mentality is holding New Zealand back because New Zealanders aren't particularly good at scaling things. We're really good at you know, doing everything ourselves mm. and trying to do everything ourselves. And when we don't know how to do something, we get one of our mates to do it, mm. who we think has some experience in that area, and they may not. Whereas people from larger, larger countries and larger economies tend to say, okay, well, what needs to happen? How do we farm this out to people who actually know that we're doing? How do we scale this? How do we take you know, this great idea that I started and actually grow beyond that in a, in a much more 
a large scale way. So I think these are some of the things that we need to work on in New Zealand and perhaps some of the areas in which uh, people uh, like the people who gathered here today can help us. Um, so I've just come back from a, a trip um, where I was invited to Israel um, to look at the um, uh, other ecosystems um, around the world um, and to look at how they relate and what we could learn for New Zealand. And, um, and one, one of the things that came out of that was a quote from Brad Feld, which was um, sort of, if you, uh, be, the, be the best boulder that you can be. Um, so in this case, it's you know, be the best New Zealand that you can be. And, and what does that look like for New Zealand? And, and to answer your question, Joseph, uh, basically um, it seems to be that um, really it's things such as primary industries um, uh, are, are an example of that. But there are some others that, for example, Matt talked about yesterday um, around, um, around video and, and um, the film industry here. It's basically looking at things that have already developed over a number of generations, such as um, the uh, Wellington film industry with the... Uh, with Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit and that sort of thing in Avatar. Um, and there's, what that has done has brought a whole lot of expertise into this country that doesn't exist in other locations. Um, so an example of that is John Lemon, um, who arrived here um, uh, to work for Weta um, and then left and started Lumio. Um, and it's those, those, sorts of, um, those sorts of skills that come in through Weta uh, create an opportunity for all sorts of, of startups to come around that, that industry, um, even if they don't seem to be related. Um, and another area that's really unique to New Zealand um, is it's because, it's because of its size means that government is really accessible. Um, and that may, means that you can actually solve a lot of problems in, on a small scale here in New Zealand that could then scale out to other countries. Um, and so that, that's already been seen um, uh, in, in various startups with, uh, with Inspiral and in, in, other, in other startups, but it seems to be a really great opportunity um, to, uh, to, to do here in New Zealand. Well, I think that, but the, the counter argument to that is that the, the government in New Zealand is about 40, 45% of GDP, and so it tends to be dominant. And so we, we, it is easy to become over reliant on government as a revenue source. Uh, in New Zealand, and I think that's something that we need to diversify as well. You know, one other really interesting thing about New Zealand is we have, I believe, the second highest rate of immigration in the world. So I think 25% of New Zealanders were actually born in some other country, and the only other country with a higher rate of immigration is Australia. And so, particularly in Wellington, um, you know, we have an incredibly diverse population. You know, we, we complain about the brain drain, but in fact, I think it's actually a brain gain because we're getting smart people from all over the rest of the world who want to come here because of the amazing environment we have, uh, because of the appropriate scale that we have, uh, who, want, who want to live here and contribute and use their international connections uh, to help improve uh, the world generally. I mean, one of the things that I found really attractive about Wellington when I moved here in 1982 was the scale. And you know that is an incredibly attractive thing about New Zealand and a real strength that we have, because you can walk from one end to Wellington to the from one end of Wellington to the other in 15 minutes, and in that time you'll probably bump into about 20 people that you know just walking along the street because everybody walks. People don't drive; they, either they walk or they take the bus. And if you don't meet them in the street, you'll meet them on the bus, and everybody takes the bus. Uh, so uh, you know it's a very close knit community where we have two degrees of separation. And if you don't know someone, you'll know someone who knows that person that you, that you want to talk to. And that scale, that appropriate scale, where people know each other and you don't want to hurt, you know, you don't want to hurt the people near you because it'll come back to you really quickly, that's actually a strength. And I think there's an opportunity there to develop uh, more of a Wellington Inc. and a New Zealand Inc. Uh, sort of approach to the world where you know people that were nominally competing with uh, turn out to be uh, our best allies on the global stage. Uh, question to Link. You're working on a project called Free Range. Uh, and as I understand it, you're trying to create a much more developed technology ecosystem here in New Zealand. Uh, can you talk to us a bit about what that project is and what are some of the key uh, gaps that you're trying to fill through that? 
So um, Free Range came out of Inspiral, um, and it, it came out of a, a challenge, which was um, the lack of capital here in, in New Zealand. And it seems to be a, a, a similar theme across other isolated ecosystems. Um, and, and so the goal was to create a startup to cultivate other startups. And um, rather than, um, and, and so basically, uh, so Free Range um, started with looking for capital um, by inviting um, international VCs such as uh, Horizons Ventures, which is a, um, uh, owned by um, Li Ka Shing as part of the um, uh, his foundation um, to New Zealand, and basically try and 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 uh, fill that sort of capital gap uh, here locally. Um, and and over that time, it, it became clear that it wasn't just capital that was that was missing, but it was actually a number of those elements in that um, in that ecosystem um, that uh, were also a lot more pressing. Than just capital, and and uh, and those come down to a number of issues. Is number one is um, is that uh, is there is a lack of experience um, in New Zealand, and it's it's a similar situation to Australia and other ecosystems. Is, is that over time it takes a while, it takes a number of generations to build up um, particular experience in in a, in an industry that um, is really really specific, um, such as uh, technology and. Um, and so what, uh, what, what ends up happening is that this, the, the particular type of brain drain that we're suffering is it's, it's the ones that where companies get acquired um, or they go to work for another company overseas um, and that experience is then not shared back into the system um, and so that the younger generation doesn't really re understand um, what it takes to scale, how much effort it takes um, and, and specifically, um, the type of um, they, they lack the type of networks that older, more experienced entrepreneurs have um, in a in a more advanced ecosystem. Um, and so, the the I guess the um, the the opportunity uh, is around um, bringing you know, inviting more uh, serial entrepreneurs, more experienced entrepreneurs into uh, into New Zealand. Um, but also to develop uh, the younger generation and to really work out ways um, of of uh, encouraging um, uh, younger entrepreneurs and giving them um, really great experiences to uh, to learn um, their skills and to develop, um, as well as um, the the other missing area is engineers, and so um, working out how to 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 fill those gaps in and uh, and um, uh, is basically one of the the main priorities for the next year, and that comes from, uh, for example, uh, basically filling it through overseas options as well as as local ones. So it's working with local universities, um, but also uh, working with um, international organisations. Um, the the really great thing that's happened over the last uh, couple of months has been that um, Immigration New Zealand has come forward. And um, and really um, decided to to sort of get involved and be become really quite proactive. They're putting a whole team together for next year, and they've really identified this as an area that they'd like to focus on as well, um, which gives me really uh, a real hope for um, for New Zealand and filling some of those gaps. So I mean, you know, Sir Paul Callahan, you know, his uh, you know his great vision for New Zealand was a place where talent wants to live. And I, I think that's, that's going to be a key part to building up our capacity to actually deliver on some of these great things that we want to do. Uh, Dave, you talked about how uh, the st startup ecosystem is more of a chaos than a uh, you know, calm, e thriving ecosystem. Uh, in that chaos, what are some of the biggest gaps that you identify that um, are keeping it as chaos, that are, are not helping it develop as we'd like it to develop? Well, I mean, I think uh, access to capital is, is a key one. Uh, so, I mean, there are a lot of startups around who would try to do something on $100,000 in New Zealand that they would get $10 million to be doing in California. Uh, so, you know, you end up with people who very scrappily uh, try to execute on an underfunded plan. Uh, so, I guess access to capital is, 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 one of the, is one of the key things. 
uh, Link pointed out access to uh, engineers and um, and uh, special, very specialized knowledge. I think that that's you know that's also uh, you know really really key element. We're great generalists, but generally don't have the opportunity to specialize in a market of four million people. But we're getting there. You know, in, in things like the film industry and things like primary industries, uh, you know, we are we are able to uh, develop you know expertise in those areas. Uh, but I think you know that uh, again the scale. You, you know, even though we're you know it's a nice scale and a very comfortable scale to live in and work in, uh, without you know people don't understand what you know the glo lo local startups have a hard time understanding global competition. And often they'll build something up and build something up and build something up and then discover that they're, you know, when they finally make that jump overseas that they're, you know, at least, you know, a dozen competitors out on the international stage. So I think that sort of contributes to, uh, to, to some of the chaos as well. And our distance, you know, the fact that it is expensive and time consuming uh, to hop on to NZ8 whenever you want to do anything in California, you know, it actually, t you know, it, it, is, it is an impediment. And you know, as wonderful as Skype and Google Hangout are, you know, it's it's there's nothing like being there face to face with people, and so, you know, it's easy to become isolated. And then, you know, when you when you get a key piece of information, you know, it causes that chaotic behavior. Um, it's something that uh, we're really pushing for um, next year is to really reduce that um, that tyranny of distance, mm -hmm. um, and that can be done um, as shown in Australia through. Um, uh, export development grants specifically aimed at um, small um, and early stage startups um, uh, through uh, basically um, giving um, some type of tax credit for for travel um, which reduces the reduces that distance down mm. Mm. you guys talk about talent and the talent uh, Dave mentioned about how we're developing really good engineers uh, but yet we don't have enough of them, and we're not meeting the demand. Um, what are the, some of the uh, attractiveness of New Zealand and the ecosystem here for not just engineers, but for uh, talented people to come and move out here? Oh, well, there, there are lots. I mean, it's the same, it's the same thing for anybody in, in, in many cases, the fact that you can live in such a livable city, uh, that you can send your kids to school, that they can walk around, uh, you know, and, and actually walk and bike to school um, and that you can feel safe, you know, wherever you are, that you can live in a community where you know where you know all of your neighbors' names and what they do and all their kids' names. Uh, and, you know, it's living, you know, it's, it's, it's living a dream, really, that you just couldn't have in most places in North America uh, where, you know, you tell your kids, you know, don't talk to strangers, uh, you know, you buy guns and, you know, all the rest of it. You know, we don't have any of that here. Um, something that's not, uh, that's just really so obvious, no one mentions it, is how safe it is here. Like when growing up in Australia, there were about 14 options to be killed in my front yard. <laughs> my, my, my grandmother almost died just bringing in the washing because she had a white tail spider underneath uh, in, the, in the sheet and it, it bit her on the arm. And she was in the hospital for months. But I mean, it just gives you an example that, that just doesn't really. Uh, doesn't really even come up here. You don't realize just how safe you are um, compared to some other places like like Australia. So other 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 things which are really interesting. Uh, when I arrived in nineteen in nineteen eighty two, um, most of the people my age had not grown up watching television because television didn't arrive in New Zealand until nineteen early nineteen sixties, and most people didn't have them until the late nineteen sixties. So most of the people my age uh, did not grow up watching television. Consequently, they read books and they talked to each other, and they were actually, I, I felt in some ways, more intelligent on average. Now there are no statistics to back this up, but you know, I felt that they were more that they were more intelligent on average than you know than the average people that you deal with uh, in, in 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 countries where people grew up watching television. I don't know whether or not that's all evened out now, or what, but I do get this sense that you know even you know if you go talk to a petrol station attendant or somebody behind. The desk at a dairy, or you know anybody you talk to, generally in New Zealand, they have a pretty good understanding of world politics, uh, of current events, of important issues, and more than anything, Kiwis care. They actually care about what's going on, not only in New Zealand but in in the rest of the world. 
And so, you know, and, and that really struck me. And I think that's a, a really important aspect, that people do care here in, in a way that they, they don't in other places. Something about the local market here as well is that, um, uh, yes, startups here have to be um, global from day one, but the local market here is used um, around the world by companies like Facebook to do their first trials. Um, and it's one of the reasons for that is because um, we are a country of early adopters and we're willing to try things. Um, and that's really great when you're starting a early stage startup to actually um, have people willing to give it a go. So the counter argument to that and something that gets me really worked up, Link, <laughs> is that New Zealand startups that use New Zealand as their, as their first market are learning all of the wrong things because they're designing their startups for a market of four million people. They take them offshore and all of a sudden they discover that in the rest of the world they need distribution. What's that distribution? In New Zealand, you know, you want to sell something to somebody, you pick up the phone, you ring them up and you say, hey, would you like to buy this? And they say yes or no and you, know, you generally do a deal with them. You know, it doesn't work like that in the rest of the world where you have you know, distribution to worry about. And so you know, New Zealand startups that are using New Zealand as a, as, as a test market are, are, as I say, are often learning really the wrong things and not focusing on the key thing that's going to kill most of them, which is distribution. Which is really highlighting the fact of how important it is to bring in that, that higher experienced talent to, to give those sorts of pieces of advice. Bring it in, but also to bring it out. So, you know, I think there needs to be this, this uh, bi-directional flow of, of talent. And, you know, the more integrated we want to be with the world economy, the more we have to, you know, be prepared to travel in both directions. So something that um, they, they've looked at Israel, and, and um, one of the things that took them um, up to the next level was um, a, a scheme with America where um, Israeli uh, uh, startups actually spent time in America, um, and it really helped them... Um, understand the, uh, the American market and, and they say that that was one of the key things that took them up. I want to open it up to questions. Uh, if anybody's got questions, we'll take uh, about three to five questions. It's kind of natural for young people want to want to have a look at the other side of the world, especially when you are in a four million um, market. So my question comes back to the fact that um, it would be great to be able to have people experience what it's like overseas but then to attract them back because everything you, you've mentioned suggests to me that it's a great place to raise your children to come back once they've learnt and had that experience and that fun in the bigger overseas metropolitan markets and that's really why we lose our young bright people and we're a case in point with our son and even though he'd like to come back he probably won't. Zero's now started up and might, might attract him back so perhaps there's a comment there that you'd like to make about that, that as, an, as an example but that's the point, that everyone wants to see what the grass is like on the other side of that number eight fence. So that's one of the, one of the strengths that New Zealand has, is that uh, our young people do go overseas uh, and travel the world widely. And you know, every New Zealander, uh, you know, when they graduate from uh, university, uh, you know, goes off on their OE, their overseas experience. And it's just an expected rite of passage that it's something you're going to do uh, in your early 20s. Unfortunately, uh, there is going to be some attrition, and we're going to lose some of these people permanently uh, to places uh, overseas. I think we'll make that up in, in people we get back, and I, I, I'm, I'm sorry that you know, they're probably not going to make up for, for your son. Uh, <laughs> my own son uh, is currently uh, over in Los Angeles. Uh, I, I don't know whether or not he'll, he'll, he'll ever be back. But you know, people do recycle, and they do come back. And you know, he, he may not be able to come back now when he's 30 or even when he's 40, Maybe when he's 50, he'll decide to come back and, um, and, and recycle, that, recycle that knowledge. So I don't think we can, you know, we can't really, you know, hold on to them. But, you know, I think if we let them go, you know, there are over a million New Zealanders overseas. So that's, that's a fifth of the population. 20% of New Zealand is in the New Zealand diaspora. And these people are actually really critical to our integration with the world economy. So, and these are our 20 million, sorry, these are our, our 1 million ambassadors that we have all over the world. So I, I think that's, that's, that's really important as well. And, and, you know, we shouldn't lose sight of that. There was some recent research done and, um, and it was found that the average successful startup um, uh, founder was 35. And so, um, so the fact that young, you know, the, our young kids are going overseas is actually great. Um, and it's just about, creating an environment here that this is 
where they choose to come back to, and that there are that the this, you know so-called ecosystem is here that it actually supports them coming back and building um, th their startup here um, later on. In in the business that I'm involved with, we actually send a whole lot of New Zealanders and Australians overseas to get work experience, um, thousands of them a year. But we actually interview them all and ask them. Uh, what they'd like to do when they come back to New Zealand and the majority of them didn't actually want to come back to New Zealand and work in, in large corporate businesses but actually wanted to come back to New Zealand and get involved in small businesses and, and helping some of their skills and indeed even injecting their capital into those businesses if they wanted to and that was 45% of of the Kiwis that lived overseas were of, were of that attitude. I think the main issue for them is actually educating them about what they can do when they get back because the ecosystem is chaotic. They don't really have any visibility of what they can do when they come back, so they just get sucked into that trap of going and working for a, for a big corporate despite the fact that that might not be what they want to do. So, Sure, my, my question was just surrounding this one million Kiwis living abroad. And I've definitely seen a lot of stats from like the Kia network that speaks of the relative success of that uh, diaspora. You know, often uh, leadership in international organizations, you see a lot of prominent Kiwis um, in the US, uh, ex you know, in leadership positions in, in big companies. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on what, what are some of the, the things that New Zealand companies or friends of New Zealand can do to take advantage of that community, this dispersed but well-connected and, and sort of values-aligned group of people. Uh, how can New Zealand really tap into that more, or, or do you feel like that's already happening? And, and just maybe share your thoughts on that. Um, I think that um, one of the things that we've, um, that we've looked into recently is that um, those overseas um, New Zealanders uh, represent potentially um, some of the country's best ambassadors. Um, and I, I think there's an opportunity to really unlock that by um, allowing them to um, actually identify people that um, they'd like to invite to come and live in New Zealand, for example. Mm. Um, so basically formalising that process. And um, I think there's a real opportunity there. Yep. So the the key, thanks, Link. The, the the Kia network is is fairly well uh, defined. I think they've always struggled to act to actualize what they're trying to achieve, uh, mainly because people have busy lives and you know they get off doing uh, whatever whatever it is that they're doing overseas and you know and you know they come back to New Zealand for the Christmas holidays and to hang out with their family uh, and then and then go back overseas. So one initiative that we started. Uh, came out of an idea uh, last year w was a thing that we're calling Worldwide Wellington Week. And this is the week leading up to Wellington Anniversary Day where we've got a Facebook page. We're going to try to get all the Wellingtonians that we know all over the world to have barbecues in their garages and do other things that are, you know, very Wellingtonian, uh, you know, to wear black, you know, black and yellow and, you know, celebrate whatever it is their connection to Wellington is. So if we can keep these people connected in some way, I think uh, I think that'll that'll be really helpful as well. Uh, kia ora, I'm Viv Maiderborn. Um, a couple of things, of course, New Ze living in New Zealand for women and children isn't safe, and I just want to make that point that we kill more of our women and children than any other developed country in the world. So um, let's not romanticise the work that there is to be done in our country and our culture in that way. Uh, um, the second thing I want to say is when we're talking about startups, I want to really make the distinction between just any old business starting up, a business starting up to be another profit taking extractionist company that's about profit making for shareholders, and startups that are about changing and disrupting the current um, power dynamics in the world and finding new ways of redistributing um, wealth in the broadest po possible sense. So I guess I'm interested when you think, when you're talking about startup, to really address this challenge of how do we do more than just grow more rip-off businesses 
that um, accumulate wealth in individuals and ignore the common good. So, um, you know, I think that's the challenge. And that's what I'm really interested to hear. How do we grow an ecosystem of that kind of startup? So, to be fair, Viv, um, I think there are very few startup entrepreneurs in New Zealand or anywhere else who go into their startup thinking that the reason that they're going to do this startup is to make a shitload of money and oppress people. Um, so I just wanted to get that out of the way. I think most people who are doing startups are really passionate about one particular idea that they want to see disrupt the entire way that things are done in that particular area and um, extract value from that by making it easier <clears throat> for people to do whatever it is that they're already doing in that area. So I think, you know, I, I think it's really good that there are lots of people doing this in all sorts of unexpected ways and they pick really odd things to be passionate about and develop and make a lot more efficient and more interesting and more fun and easy to do. And I think that the, um, the value that's unleashed by that um, actually contributes to uh, increasing, um, uh, increasing levels of well-being everywhere. So I think it's really important that that kind of stuff keeps on continuing uh, as it is. I do think that, there, that, 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 that the question that you ask is a valid one, though, and that how do we focus people more on addressing uh, issues like inequality in society uh, or poverty or violence or you know other social issues how do we encourage people to focus on that as well as you know all of the other things I think the only answer to that is to make sure that we get people passionate about that to the degree that they want to risk everything because that's what you do when you do a startup you basically risk everything in order to achieve that goal so how do we do that that's that's the real question I think the, um, uh, the the interesting thing about New Zealand is that um, we've all chosen, a, a lot of us have chosen to be here, um, and that the reasons that the types of reasons that we've chosen to be here are exactly the are quite um, similar in the very reasons that we want to start those sorts of businesses, um, and I think the emergence of Inspiral as an example of that um, it has really um, uh, is a really good um, uh, example for the the hope that I have in in New Zealand's role in those sorts of startups, um, and um, I think that um, you know you're sort of bringing up uh, sort of you know the other like, let's not sort of paint a rosy picture. I think that the other thing that we haven't discussed is that um, in this you know the feedback from international VCs on the New Zealand ecosystem is that there is another there is another um, issue here, and that and that issue is around. Um, uh, not the fact. It, basically, the feedback was that startups here are great, have great design. You know, they're very you know, huge. Uh, the design um, thinking um, is amazing for for um, this country and the, and uh, the startups within. But what's missing is a, a basically a way of creating something that's um, uh, that has um, as type of protectability. Um, and and the, the the fact that IP is not protected well uh, means that uh, these startups can't get the sort of capital that they might attract if they did that well. Um, and there's this local, that seems to be a local trend in the past of let's just get it of of saying let's just get something going quickly, uh, rather than thinking about how to protect that uh, intellectual property. <coughs> Hang on, Link. Who? Who are we designing these startups for? Are we designing them specifically for investors or are we designing them to change the world and to um, you know, create value? So if you're trying to design something for an investor, then definitely you look at IP protectability as, as, as being a key, a key aspect of something that you want to work at. On the other hand, there are plenty of other business models. Uh, I mean, I'm a really passionate open source sort of person. Don't get me wrong, I, I think it's completely possible to have really good business models around stuff that's essentially free. Uh, and that you know, comes down to how well you can execute. Um, so you know, there, there are lots of different business models, but I think in terms of the IP protectability, you, know, you really have to you know, ask the question quo vadis, you know, who is it that's benefiting uh, from that protectability? Um, I guess it's just a balance. So if you're too far on the, the, um, on the open side, then it becomes harder and harder to actually get the, the scale and to, to attract the capital to actually grow it. So it just there's a balance. 
Um, and ultimately, it's um, just the feedback is that it's just too far on that side to attract, if you're going to try and attract VC funding to do something. Otherwise, you're going to have to look for other sources, which we end up doing. And, um, and startups like Lumio are finding really interesting ways of doing that. But it's just harder. It is harder. Cool. Uh, one last question, Josh over there. I'm just curious about um, next three years, if you could make, wave a magic wand around here, what would you like to see change? Like, what's, <laughs> what's, what do you want to see that's not here right now? <laughs> Give me a moment. Um, personally, I'd like to um, imagine that, uh, that we're further down the track of that, that um, more complete ecosystem and that, um, that, there's, uh, that there are more... Um, I mean, Yosef and I talked about this um, uh, earlier in the year and it was sort of imagining that more people were moving here, the, um, more people were moving back. Um, we were attracting uh, more experienced serial entrepreneurs that decided to move to New Zealand or um, even part-time to start things here. Um, and that there was a more of an awareness of entrepreneurship um, as uh, in the local, the local environment. So um, make no mistake, we're, as, as a country and as a, 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 you know, a, a startup world, uh, we're still bootstrapping. And we have to do that one success at a time. And there are no shortcuts. You know, it's not like I can wave a magic wand, I mean, as nice as it would be, and, you know, immediately poof, you know, everything is there the way we want it to be. So we have to keep on building our, our resilience. Uh, we need to celebrate failure better than we do and give people the... Um, the permission and the encouragement to try something really hard to the degree where they might fail, because I think Kiwis uh, probably have less um, sort of resilience to failure than, than uh, say, people in Silicon Valley, for example. Um, so keep on en encouraging that. So I want to see more people trying harder and failing and having those failures um, you know, be celebrated. Uh, but at the same time, I think recycling the talent that we have well is really, really important, and that is the key to success in bootstrapping, is build more success stories, uh, have those people come back and do it again, and come back and do it again, and encourage others uh, to do it again by recycling their own capital, uh, their own expertise, uh, their own networks. So, you know, it's a bit hackneyed, but, you know, if you look at Rod Drury and the way he's built up his career, uh, he's the, uh, the, uh, the chairman of Zero and the founder of, of Zero, the accounting software firm. But if you look at it the way he did it, you know, he started with a, with a web development firm. He built that into you know, a, a, another technology company, sold that, developed that into another technology, sold that, came back, and started Zero. So you know, it's that recycling, recycling problem. Uh, re recycling thing, which is really good, and you know, keep on striving at, at at solving problems that are really, really hard that people are passionate about. I remember when when Rod Drewy first started Zero, uh, you know, I thought I thought he was trying to solve a problem that was just too hard to solve, and uh, and yet he's made a, a huge success of it and took huge amounts of risk uh, and applied huge amounts of his own money and other people's money to make it happen, and did it, and so good on him. So we need more of that recycling effort uh, happening uh, in terms of talent and capital uh, within, within New Zealand. Cool. Marty, last question. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for sharing. It's really inspiring, Dave Link. Um, I'm curious, uh, especially for anyone watching this on video, how can we learn more about the projects you guys are involved in and websites and URLs? Right. Well, uh, for me, uh, I guess the key ones, I, I've got my own blog, dave.moskovitz.co.nz. Uh, Lightning Lab is lightninglab.co.nz. I guess those are uh, uh, those are the key ones for me. Um, freerangefarm.co.nz. That's good. So thanks, everyone. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you both for sharing the many exciting opportunities, but also challenge that we face here. Uh, just one last comment I want to make is uh, relating to uh, the scale. Uh, of New Zealand here and the opportunities to make a big impact is something that we have noticed when we moved here um, and when I moved here about 11 months ago uh, and uh, what's exciting for us is just an opportunity to contribute and help uh, some of the chaos 
uh, thrive better. Uh, I don't think we can stop it from being a chaos, but we can help it thrive and utilize some of the skills, resources, and relationships that were built um, in the Silicon Valley ecosystem uh, to meet some of the needs and in investments, uh, some of the needs in talent. Uh, because a lot of the people we're, we've been talking to in meeting are looking for something a bit more meaningful uh, to do and ways to utilize their skills and knowledge. And uh, I want to give them an opportunity for them to come here and contribute in, in the ways they can. Uh, so we're, we're setting up an entity called Kiwi Connect. Um, we're, uh, it's in very early stages and we'll be launching our website quite soon. Uh, but we'll send you guys uh, a quick note about it once, when that is out. Uh, but thank you very much for sharing your uh, knowledge and skills and uh, wisdom and uh, hope to continue this conversation and uh, contribute to the thriving of this chaos. Thank you. Cheers.